how utterly undetectable murder could be made. It was amazing. Why did not more intelligent people take it up? Perhaps they did, and one never heard of it. But Dr. Bickley could not quite believe that. Surely he was unique. At 3.30 exactly, he stepped blithely out of the jowet in front of Chatford's house. Two minutes later, his goal was triumphantly reached. Chatford was in a bad way. That was quite evident. He lay inertly in bed, obviously in a state of extreme collapse, and seemed hardly conscious. Dr. Bickley stood for a moment looking down on him, and could hardly control the muscles of his face. I'll take his temperature, he said in a low voice. No need, Dr. Lidston replied in equally hushed tones. I've just taken it. He beckoned Dr. Bickley into a farther corner. Seems to have just taken a turn for the worse, he whispered. Since I rang you up, temperatures jumped up to 102.8. Dr. Bickley nodded. I'd better make a cursory examination. I shouldn't advise disturbing him just at the moment. I can tell you anything you want to know. Well, what are the other symptoms? Oh, what one would expect. Tongue slightly furred, considerable abdominal pain, cramps in the lower limbs, and, of course, vomiting and diarrhoea. Pronounced, Dr. Bickley asked sharply. Dr. Lidston hesitated. Well, perhaps not so pronounced as one might have expected, no. Any paralytic symptoms? I don't think so. Well, possibly. I haven't particularly noticed. Dr. Bickley looked his contempt at such inefficiency. Well, have the pupils been dilated? Yes, Dr. Lidston seemed to brighten. Oh, yes, decidedly. And you've been treating him just with a bismuth and soda mixture with hydrocyanic acid? And bismuth salicylate, uh, 15 grains every four hours. I see. And um, what's your diagnosis? In my opinion, said Dr. Lidston, somewhat defensively, acute gastroenteritis resulting from food poisoning. Yes, Dr. Bickley said gently. I don't agree with you, Lidston. No. Dr. Lidston was surprised. No. From what I've seen of him, and from what you tell me, I should say it was a clear case of botulism. Botulism? It was plain that the idea had not entered Dr. Lidston's head at all. Yes. Of course, I was practically sure from my own case and Mrs. Bourne's but they were really too light to be certain. That's why I wanted to see him. I'm pretty certain where the infection came from, too. We had potted meat sandwiches for tea, and, well, really, there was no other possible vehicle. Good gracious! But that ought to be ascertained, Bickley. Is the rest of the potted meat still in existence? No. I thought the sandwiches tasted a little funny at the time, and I went out to the kitchen afterwards and smelt it. Dr. Bickley explained how he and Mrs. Holm had arrived at the conclusion that the pot had better be thrown away. Dear, dear, Dr. Liston stroked his lean chin. Botulism? No, I must confess that never occurred to me. In fact, I've never had a case before at all. Ah, that's where I scored, Dr. Bickley pointed out. I had a case in Wyvern's Cross. Unfortunately, it proved fatal, but it gave me the experience. I attribute the promptness with which I was able to cure myself entirely to that. No doubt, no doubt. Well, what do you advise, then? A full dose of jalap and cream of tartar, replied Dr. Bickley promptly. And in view of his condition, the sooner it's administered, the better. Luckily, I brought one with me. You did, said Dr. Lidston with interest. 
Yes. I was practically certain, you see, and I judged that speed would be advisable. Here it is. Dr. Bickley drew a small pillbox from his trousers' pocket and extracted the capsule with its fatal content of culture jelly. I'd better administer it at once. How incredibly easy it all was. I'll administer it, I think, said Dr. Lidston a little stiffly. With a hidden smile at the childishness of this exhibition of professional jealousy, Dr. Bickley handed the capsule over. All the better. Let Lidston kill him. It made the situation still more amusing. Dr. Bickley watched the administration with calm pleasure. He felt no more compunction than before in his own drawing room. Chatford was not the sort of person to arouse that. With his usual preciseness, Dr. Lidston half-filled a tumbler with water and approached the bed. I want you to take this, he said gently, and Chatford's eyes slowly opened. He had not the strength to raise his head, and Dr. Lidston had to support it and put the capsule in his mouth for him. It took several efforts and sips of the water before Chatford intimated that it had gone down. As Dr. Lidston carefully laid the head on the pillows again, Dr. Bickley turned away and looked out of the window. He had to do so to hide a small smile of triumph which he simply could not suppress. Well, that was the end of Dan Chatford and his mischief-making. Hey-ho for Ivy, and independence at last. Now that the thing was done, his senses seemed strangely intensified. He turned back from the window and looked round the room as he had not done before, and seemed to take everything in at one sweeping glance. The big double bed in which the sick man lay... Chatford was evidently old-fashioned. It was always the man on that question who was the old-fashioned one. The cup of arrowroot on the bedside table, the medicine bottle of milky-looking fluid on the mantelpiece, the tumbler, and two smaller bottles, surgery bottles too on the washstand, the very feminine dressing table with its wing mirrors. How very curious to reflect that this was Ivy's room as well as Chatford's. Most curious. Abstractedly, he strolled with unconscious professional instinct towards the washstand. Why surgery bottles? And labels indicating their contents, too. Most unusual. Sod, carb, sol. Tinct, fur, perclaw. And the bottle on the mantelpiece. But the contents of that were not stated. Well, I think we'd better leave him, suggested Dr. Lidston. Dr. Bickley, who had no further object in staying, quite agreed. Downstairs, the two chatted for a moment about the case and Chatford's chances of recovery, which they agreed in putting none too high. Dr. Bickley asked whether Mrs. Chatford had been sent for and was told that everything necessary and possible had been done. He prepared to say goodbye. But Lidston, it seemed, was positively loath to let him go. Not out of Chatford's house. They both left that briskly enough. But then it appeared that Lidston had not brought his car, and Dr. Bickley had to give him a lift home. And, as if overcome by gratitude for this service, Lidston pressed him so strongly to stay to tea that, eager though he was to get away, it was simply impossible to refuse. Dr. Lidston explained earnestly that his wife was out, and seemed to think this still another excellent reason for Dr. Bickley staying to tea. And afterwards, he had so many questions to ask about botulism and food poisoning in general, and a dozen other subjects, that it was past five o'clock before Dr. Bickley got away. When finally he was allowed to escape, he drove back to Wyvern's Cross in a kind of trance of satisfaction. It was only when he had got home and put the car away that a query which had been lying submerged in his mind rose to the surface. 
Why on earth? Tincture of perchloride of iron. He took down the Materia Medica in his consulting room bookshelf and looked it up. The next moment he laughed out loud. The combination of ferric, perchloride and sodium carbonate with the tumbler, on the washstand, the arrowroot, the demulcent drinks and the milky-looking stuff on the mantelpiece, obviously calcined magnesia. Why, it was as plain as a pike staff. That old fool Lidston had been treating Chatford for arsenical poisoning. Well, after all, the symptoms are identical with those of gastroenteritis. So that was why he had come round so suddenly. Wanted to see if he himself would diagnose the same thing. How extraordinarily funny. Lidston had suspected arsenical poisoning and... Dr. Bickley's mirth ended sharply. Arsenic. That was where the arsenic motif came in. Nothing to do with Julia at all. Good heavens. But surely they could not suspect. He dropped into a chair, literally. His knees had suddenly lost their strength. They did suspect. They must suspect. Why else should the chief inspector have questioned him so closely about arsenic. They suspected him of having administered arsenic to Madeleine and Chatford. That reference to gossip about Julia had been just a blind. The man had been trying to trap him into an admission of possessing arsenic. But how could they suspect such a thing? Chatford's symptoms were not unlike those of arsenical poisoning, it was true, but the presence or absence of arsenic in the body could be ascertained in a moment by any competent analyst, and the analyst's report would have been negative. So how could they suspect? Dr. Bickley leaned forward over the table, his head on his hands. He must keep calm. He must think this properly out. They had suspected arsenical poisoning, but they might not have suspected himself as its administrator? No, that would not do. The chief inspector would not have questioned him like that if he had not been suspected as the administrator. Well, then, they had suspected him of administering arsenic, but they couldn't do so any longer, because by now they must have got the analyst's report that there was no arsenic in the eliminations. What would they be thinking now, then? Obviously that the illness had been due to natural causes, that their suspicions had been unfounded, beastly, lying. They must be thinking that. There was nothing else to think. And that was why Lidston had changed his mind. Lidston would have been in the confidence of the police. He would have known of the suspicion. Naturally, then, he had refused to let him see Chatford this morning. But after he had left, Lidston had heard of the analyst's report and realised that arsenic couldn't be in question at all. The illness was perfectly natural, and he had called Dr Bickley in not only to get a helpful opinion, but in a way to make amends for the baseness of... Wait a minute, though. Suppose the whole thing had been a trap. Suppose that arsenic being out of the question, Lidston and everybody else had been puzzled as to what really was the matter with Chatford. The analyst could find no poison, but they persisted in their beastly idea that Dr. Bickley had poisoned Chatford. Supposing they had called him in with the hope that he would give himself away and tell them what the trouble really was. And Good God! That was exactly what he had done. Diagnosed an obscure disease like botulism without a proper examination of anything, given himself right into their hands. Wait a minute again, though. No good getting flustered. Supposing that really was the truth. Well, what did it matter? He was competent to diagnose botulism, and botulism was a natural disease, no question of poison there. 
His idea all along had been to establish botulism as soon as possible. That couldn't be wrong now, could it? No, not possibly. How could the establishment of botulism possibly be wrong? Oh, God! The capsule! The capsule that he had pretended to contain jalap and cream of tartar. But Lidston had administered it. Chatford had swallowed it. He had seen him with his own eyes. That definitely precluded the possibility of a trap. And of suspicion, too. Good heavens, yes. They wouldn't have invited a suspected man in and calmly administered anything he brought with him, would they? No, that was final. What a hell of a relief. And what a hell of a stew he had been getting into over nothing at all. He really must look after his nerves. This sort of thing was really silly. Oh, God, though. Suppose Lidston hadn't administered it at all. Suppose he had only been pretending. And Chatford had been only pretending, too. Suppose the thing had been a trap, arranged by the police, in the hope that Dr. Bickley would bring something for administration which they could get their filthy hands on and so find out the cause of the trouble that way. And that was exactly what he had done. He had walked straight into it. It was all up. Absolutely all up. How they must be chuckling now. What was he to do? Oh, God! Dr. Bickley banged on the table with his fist. This was getting too absurd. Of course, nothing of the sort had happened. It was this damned imagination of his. Chatford had swallowed the capsule. He had seen him with his own eyes. Had he seen him? He lived the scene through, staring intently down the table. Yes, Chatford must have swallowed it, must have. Very well, then. That was enough of this silly panicking. It was no good going on like this. Nobody suspected anything. And even if they did, it didn't matter, because they would never be able to prove anything, neither about Julia nor anything else. He had covered his tracks too well for that. But there was no harm in taking reasonable precautions. The incubator, for instance. That might prove an awkward piece of evidence. It would not be wanted any more. Better destroy it, just in case. And there's no time like the present. He jumped to his feet, his overstrung nerves welcoming action. As he passed through the hall... Mrs. Holm called to him from the kitchen. Are you ready for your tea, sir? I've had it, thank you, Mrs. Holm. Very well, sir. Oh, and the man came about the cistern, sir, and he said... Mrs. Holm's words faded into silence as he ran up the stairs two at a time. What man? About what cistern? He could not be bothered with cisterns at the moment. When you've got a job in hand, do it. He threw open the door of the attic and advanced confidently, till a sudden realisation brought him up short in his tracks, with blanched face and incredulous eyes. The incubator had gone. That evening, three men came to see Dr. Bickley. He received them calmly, for he had known they would be coming. Every moment of the interview before him, every possible development, he had gone over again and again in the interval that had been allowed him. Now that the time had come, he was surprised to notice how cool he was. Chief Inspector Russell entered first, then another equally large man, and then a tall, military-looking man who shut the door behind them. Dr. Bickley, a minnow among these tritons, looked at them inquiringly. The chief inspector indicated the second man. Uh, this is Superintendent Allhays from Exeter, Doctor, he said with the greatest geniality. He's got something to say to you. Yes, said Dr. Bickley politely, 
and looked puzzled. But his heart had given a sudden jump. Surely they were not going to... Look here, come into my consulting room, won't you? Superintendent Allhays, a stolid man, intimated that perhaps that might be a sound move. The quartet trooped into the consulting room. The third man stationed himself by the door in an unpleasantly ominous manner. Superintendent Allhays began to speak. He spoke in a curious, sing-song voice, with his eyes half-closed. Quite obviously, he had learnt his words off by heart. Dr. Bickley felt a foolish wish to giggle. He looked so funny. Enquiries have been made concerning the recent illnesses of Mrs. Madeline Bourne and Mr. William Chatford, after taking tea with you here on the 14th instant. They were taken ill shortly after they left you on that date with violent sickness and other symptoms. These symptoms agree with the symptoms of gastroenteritis, such as might be caused by contaminated food. Acting on instructions from me, Detective Sergeant Tanner of Scotland Yard made a search this afternoon of your dustbin. In it he found a half-consumed jar of potted meat, which has since been shown to contain germs which might have caused such illnesses. It is therefore necessary to inquire whether, and if so how, and by whom, this contaminated potted meat might have been added to the food partaken of at your tea party. It has occurred to me, therefore, that you might like to make a statement regarding your own actions on the 14th instant, why Mr. and Mrs. Bourne and Mr. Chatford were asked to tea, as to what you know of this contaminated potted meat, and any other observations which you might like to make and which might throw light on the matter. But... I must add that anything you say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence hereafter. He stopped and looked at Dr. Bickley with eyes suddenly quite open. Certainly I'll tell you anything I can, Dr. Bickley replied easily. He was feeling quite weak with relief. Not a word about Julia, not a single word. They must have decided to drop that, seeing that it was hopeless. Well, what could they have proved in any case? Nothing. As for this other matter, well, somehow or other, that seemed very small beer compared with Julia. Besides, Chatford wasn't dead yet. There's a good deal too much of this contaminated food going about. He had decided already to feign complete ignorance of the grim implications in the superintendent's words. His attitude should be the perfectly normal one of a doctor in consultation with police on a matter of public welfare. That would be far the best. Besides, it was inconceivable that they could arrest him. Even including the incubator, they had no real evidence at all. They were only trying to frighten some admission out of him. Well, they had come to the wrong man for that kind of thing. I was afraid there was something wrong with that particular jar as soon as I smelt it. But perhaps you'd like me to begin at the beginning. If you please, said the superintendent, and nodded towards the door. Detective Sergeant Tanner came forward, seated himself at the table, and produced some sheets of paper and a fountain pen. Now, Doctor. Dr. Bickley in a perfectly collected manner, began to speak. The jar of potted meat was bought by my housekeeper, Mrs... Excuse me, doctor, interrupted the superintendent. If you wouldn't mind beginning by saying that I cautioned you before you said anything, just to be on the safe side for me. Certainly, Dr. Bickley agreed amiably. Of course. I should like to say, first of all, that suppose you began something like this. I, 
Edmund Alfred Bickley, having been cautioned by Superintendent Allhays that anything I may say may be used in evidence hereafter, wish to make the following statement. That will do very well, nodded Dr. Bickley, leaning against the mantelpiece. Detective Sergeant Tanner at the table wrote busily. Got that? Dr. Bickley asked. The jar of potted meat was bought... Er, uh, no. Better say, the jar of potted meat, which has since proved to be contaminated, was bought by my... Sorry to interrupt, Doctor, remarked Chief Inspector Russell in friendly tones. But what about putting that in later, when you come to it? I should suggest you begin by giving an account of your acquaintance with Mr. Chetford and Mr. and Mrs. Bourne. Is that really necessary? Well, it'd look better, don't you think? Just as you like. Though it seems rather irrelevant to me. Well, then, I have known Mr. Chatford for some years. He was... Relations always friendly, remarked the Chief Inspector, studying the ceiling with apparently great interest. Perfectly. Well... I should mention that. Our relations have always been perfectly friendly and until his marriage, eh? How do you mean? You were telling me last night he married an old flame of yours, said Chief Inspector Russell most jovially. Oh, well. Dr. Bickley smiled. The Chief Inspector smiled too. Only the stolid austerity of Superintendent Allhays failed to relax before this human touch. But that didn't affect our relations with each other in the least. Oh, come, Doctor. Not when you were still sweet on her yourself. Dr. Bickley's smile broadened. So that was the motive they were trying to hang on him, was it? Remove Chatford and Ivy would be free. Clever of them to have got more or less the right one. But not so clever as he could be in demolishing it completely. Come, the ordeal was not going to be so bad if they couldn't produce anything better than this. But I wasn't, he said gently. Not in the least. If I had been, I should have married her myself. My wife was no longer alive at the time of Mr. Chatford's marriage, you must remember. Our relations have always been perfectly friendly and have continued so till the present day. Oh, but one minute, Doctor, said the Chief Inspector, reproachfully. You really can't put it quite like that, can you? Not when you were telling me last night how he hates you, what with that grudge you mentioned and so on. You can't say the relations between the two of you have remained friendly till the present day. Oh, well put in on my part. That's perfectly true. Detective Sergeant Tanner looked up inquiringly. I've continued so on my part? Yes. It went on. The officers had arrived at twenty minutes past nine. At a quarter to one, Dr. Bickley suggested an adjournment till the following day, or rather, till later in the same day. I'm sorry, Doctor returned the superintendent unsmilingly. It's our rule that statements must be taken straight through without a break. But we shall be here till daybreak at this rate if you keep on questioning every single thing I say. Oh, really, Doctor? protested Chief Inspector Russell. Come now, sir, you can't say that. We only make a suggestion occasionally uh, to see you do yourself justice. Oh, yes. That's very likely, isn't it? Dr. Bickley snapped. Well, if we must go on, I suppose we must. But anyhow, I'm going to have a drink and some biscuits. I'll get the decanter. Now, that's what I call a really good idea, observed the Chief Inspector with enthusiasm. I'll give you a hand. Oh, I can manage. No need for you to bother. It's no bother at all, Doctor, returned Russell, almost affectionately and accompanied Dr. Bickley out of the room. At ten minutes past three, the statement was finished. 
At Superintendent Orhay's request, the sergeant read it through in a flat, entirely expressionless voice. I, Edmund Alfred Bickley, having been cautioned by Superintendent Orhay's that anything I say may be used in evidence hereafter, wish to make the following statement. I have known Mr. Chatford for some years. Our relations have always been perfectly friendly and have continued so on my part till the present day. Mrs. Bourne I have only known for about two years. She was a friend of my wife's and I used to see her a good deal when my wife was alive. But since her marriage, I have scarcely seen her at all. Mr. Dennis Bourne, I have known for about ten years, but never very well. I had not invited Mr. Chatford to tea on the 14th. He suggested it himself. I had invited him previously to discuss a legal matter of some fishing rights in which I am interested, but he had been unable to come. I did invite Mr. and Mrs. Bourne on the 14th. My reason was that there had been a slight coolness between us, which I thought too petty to continue, and I wished to put an end to it. I invited Mr. and Mrs. Bourne after I knew Mr. Chatford was coming, because I thought his presence would ease things, and the legal business was not so important that it could not wait a few days. On the day in question, Mr. and Mrs. Bourne arrived first, and I took them into my garden and showed them my roses. Mr. Chatford arrived at about 4.40 p.m., and we all then went into the drawing room, where tea was at once served. The food was on plates on a wicker cake stand. The food consisted of buttered buns, potted meat sandwiches, and a cherry cake. I remember Mr. Chatford said that he was very fond of potted meat sandwiches, and he ate several of them. We all ate the sandwiches, but Mr. Chatford ate most. Mrs. Bourne at least. So far as I remember, everybody partook of all the food that was present. No sandwiches were left on the plate. I fancied I detected a slightly unpleasant taste in one of the sandwiches I ate, but I did not remark on it. I did not attach any importance to it. I remember Mr. Chatford saying that he was working very hard at the time, and that his wife had gone to Spain for a holiday, and he wished he could have gone with her. As a medical man, I consider that if he was in a state of exhaustion through overwork, he would be specially liable to an attack of gastroenteritis if any irritant were introduced into his stomach. This is my opinion now. I did not know before he told me that he was overworked. All the food which was served had been prepared by Mrs. Holm, my housekeeper. She had bought the jar of potted meat, but I cannot say where. She cut and prepared the sandwiches, and to the best of my knowledge, they were not out of her observation from the time she made them till we all arrived in the drawing room for tea. I did not ask her this, but in the ordinary course of her duties it would be so. After my guests had gone, I was speaking to Mrs. Holm on some other matter, and mentioned to her that I had thought one of the sandwiches tasted peculiar. I asked her to fetch me the pot. She did so, and we both smelt it. It seemed to both of us, to smell a little bad. Mrs. Holm seemed to think this more strongly than I did. I still did not attach very much importance to the fact, but to be on the safe side, I suggested that the unconsumed portion of the contents had better be thrown away. I threw it in the dustbin myself. I am not in the least surprised to learn now that the potted meat had been found to be contaminated and unfit for consumption. I can suggest no other explanation of how it came to be so, beyond the obvious one that it was in that state when bought. I am interested in chemical and similar experiments. Such research work as a practitioner in general practice can undertake has always been a hobby of mine. I was reading recently an account of how the gas masks used for our troops in the war were manufactured, 
and this caused me to experiment with passing chlorine through a solution of sodium thiosulfate. I have never conducted any experiments involving arsenic. I have never handled arsenic in any form except the foulest solution which I keep in my surgery. In connection with my experiments, I ordered an incubator a few weeks ago from Messrs. Rabbage and Company, Wigmore Street, London. I do not know the exact date. It was about the time that I had a case of botulism under my observation here. My purpose in ordering the incubator was to conduct certain experiments in biochemistry. I am interested in the action of the digestive juices on certain articles of diet and wish to carry out tests of my own. I did carry out these tests and verified certain conclusions which I had formed. That was some weeks ago. The last occasion on which I used the incubator was after my guests had gone on the 14th. It occurred to me that it would be an interesting experiment to ascertain if the potted meat that had been used for the sandwiches was really contaminated or not. I therefore went out to the dustbin and took a sample from the pot, which I afterwards again threw away. I then prepared a culture to the best of my ability from the sample of potted meat of any bacilli which might have been inhabiting it. It was my intention to send a portion of the culture up to some eminent bacteriologist for identification of the bacilli, if any. I have myself no practical experience of bacteriology, but I have a rudimentary knowledge of its principles. I have not the apparatus necessary to effect an identification myself, nor am I competent to separate a particular bacillus. But I thought it an interesting experiment to endeavour to make a culture. I was more than doubtful whether there were any bacilli in the potted meat at all, but I thought it worth trying as an experiment. On the 15th, I separated a portion of the culture, which I enclosed in a large capsule, with a view to examining it later under the microscope in my surgery to see if I could make out whether it was ready to send away. The idea of enclosing it in a capsule occurred to me because I was preparing another capsule containing a strong dose of jalap and cream of tartar for Mr. Chatford, after I had been called in for a consultation on his case by Dr. Lidston. It occurred to me then that a capsule would form an excellent temporary container for a portion of the jelly holding a certain group of bacilli, as it could be sealed without disturbing the jelly and so prevent contamination from the atmosphere. I had also the idea of making a purer culture of this particular group, which I had not identified, and it was therefore necessary to separate it from the rest before it could be overrun by a more powerful organism. Owing to pressure of work and other matters, I have not yet had time to examine the group. So far as I know, the capsule containing the portion of culture is still where I left it yesterday, in a pillbox filled with cotton wool, in the right hand, top drawer of the surgery dresser. I have no reason to suppose that it could be anywhere else. During the night of the 14th, I was taken ill. Since my wife died, I live alone, and therefore had to attend to myself as best I could. I attributed my illness to having eaten something which disagreed with me. But instead of the abdominal pain accompanied by violent sickness and purging, which, as a medical man, I should have expected in such a case, my symptoms were almost entirely of a paralytic nature. This led me to diagnose an attack of botulism. Having recently had a case of botulism under my observation, I am conversant with its symptoms. As soon as I was sufficiently recovered to go downstairs, I took a large dose of jalap and cream of tartar, which my experience has shown me is the most effective way of combating this disease. I very soon obtained relief and by further treatment succeeded in eliminating the poison from my system. 
Fortunately, my attack was a mild one, and by the next morning I was almost completely recovered, though I was unable to eat any breakfast. As soon as I was informed, in the afternoon, that Mr. Chatford had also been taken ill, I sent a message offering my services in conjunction with those of his own medical man. Mr. Chatford, however, having already called in Dr. Lidston, I did not press the point. In the afternoon I called upon Mr. and Mrs. Bourne to make sure that they had not been taken ill, and was distressed to find Mrs. Bourne in bed with symptoms somewhat similar to my own, though, unfortunately, a little more severe. I was now convinced that these three illnesses must have been caused by something we had all eaten at tea on the 14th at my house, which pointed conclusively to the potted meat. When I heard the next day that Mr. Chatford was really seriously ill, I made a special journey into Merchester and again offered my services, this time to Dr. Lidston, feeling that he, as a medical man, would appreciate the value of the experience in this somewhat rare disease which I could afford. Dr. Lidston considered the matter and informed me that he could not avail himself of my services without Mr. Chatford's consent. Soon after I returned home, however, he rang me up and asked me to go back for a consultation. I did so, taking with me the large dose of jalap and cream of tartar, which I had prepared and put into a capsule for the purpose. I saw Mr. Chatford, and was able to inform Dr. Lidston that he was clearly suffering from botulism. I also gave Dr. Lidston the capsule containing the jalap and cream of tartar to administer to him if he thought advisable. I cannot say whether Dr. Lidston administered this dose while I was in the room or not. I think not, as Mr. Chatford was in a state of considerable collapse at that time, but I did not really notice. It was obvious to me, from the lack of improvement in Mr. Chatford's condition, that Dr. Lidston's treatment had been on mistaken lines and I was anxious that he should understand what was the real cause of the illness. In my opinion, the potted meat, having become contaminated through natural causes, was undoubtedly responsible for the illnesses of Mr. Chatford, Mrs. Bourne, and myself, and I am unable to throw any further light on the matter. I make this statement quite voluntarily and without being questioned. There, Doctor, said Chief Inspector Russell, almost indecently jovial considering the hour. That's correct, isn't it? That's exactly what you want to put forward? Dr. Bickley rubbed his hands gently together. Quite, I think. They had tried to wear him down by keeping him up so late, but again they'd got hold of the wrong man. A doctor doesn't lose his wits through having to exercise them half the night. He'd soon lose his practice as well if he did. Superintendent Allhays smothered a yawn. He had got out of the ways of night work since reaching his present rank. Do you wish to make any corrections, additions, or erasures before you sign it? None at all, thank you. I'll sign it now. Dr. Bickley took the sergeant's pen from him and bent over the table. He was glowing with triumph. There were one or two awkward juxtapositions in the statement, and a few things which he would have preferred to gloss over, or perhaps have worded rather differently. In fact, the wording all through was absurd. But what could you expect when each single sentence was discussed for several minutes separately and apart from its context before being written down, but nothing to which he could take a real exception? And on the whole, the police had been very fair, much fairer than he had expected. That bit at the end was bunkum, of course, just put in to save their faces, but they really had been quite reasonable. Chief Inspector Russell particularly... Dr. Bickley quite liked that big, cheerful, paternal-looking man. No, 
There were one or two awkward juxtapositions, perhaps, but they simply didn't count compared with the marvellous, the utterly glorious way in which he had turned their own traps back on them. There had been only two possible bits of evidence against him, and both of them he had completely demolished. The idea had seemed sound when it occurred to his flogged brain just before dinner. Hearing it read over in the statement, he could have crowed aloud. The incubator and the capsule absolutely and entirely convincing. The evidence knocked clean out of their hands. Nothing but suspicion left. And you can't arrest a murderer on suspicion? Oh, dear, no. Only felonious loiterers and housebreakers and low scum like that. Not an artist in death like Edmund Alfred Bickley Esquire. M.R.C.S. L.R.C.P. Good gracious, no. Dr. Bickley had a task not to laugh as he signed his name with an unusually bold flourish and added the date underneath. Nearly half past three and no arrest to compensate them. Well, but of course, they could hardly have been expected to realise what kind of a man they had to deal with. They didn't come up against Edmund Bickley's every day. Suspicion would remain, of course, but what on earth was suspicion? With any luck, Chatford ought to be dead by now. Dr. Bickley straightened up. Well, that's done at last. Now then, what about that drink you wouldn't have a couple of hours ago? No need to keep your minds sharp any longer, you know? Say when, Chief Inspector... And we'll drink a silent toast to a speedy death in the Chetford family. No, thank you. I won't change my mind, Doctor. No, said Dr. Bickley indifferently. Let him sulk, then, if he wanted to. Superintendent, say when. I think, Doctor, said the Chief Inspector in a strangely gentle voice, that the superintendent's got something different to say to you. The superintendent seemed to shake himself together. He drew a little nearer to Dr. Bickley and fixed him with his rigid gaze. Edmund Alfred Bickley, it is my duty to warn you that anything you say may be taken down and used in evidence hereafter. I now arrest you on a charge of attempting to murder Mr. William Chatford and Mrs. Madeline Bourne, by administering to them poisonous germs at Wyvern's Cross on the 14th of September, 1929. Dr. Bickley had been experiencing a curious sensation. A shell seemed to have exploded quite close to his head, as one or two had done in the war. He had undergone once more just that same perception-numbing reverberation, that violent rocking of the brain in the brain pan which momentarily paralyzes the processes of the mind. There was even the old shrill singing in his ears, so piercing as to be physically excruciating. Slowly, his stunned senses recovered, apprehended, examined, rejected this preposterous misstatement. You can't, he said, in a small but very distinct voice. You've no evidence. No evidence at all. Chief Inspector Russell laid a huge, not unfriendly hand on the little man's shoulder. Better not say anything just now, Doctor. Dr. Bickley looked up at him. His mouth worked impotently. Only his dry tongue rasped against the parched roof of his mouth with a rustling, scratchy sound. Speech had completely deserted him. It was probably just as well. Here, hold up, Doctor. Sergeant, give him a chair. Come on. I'll mix you a drink. A real stiff one, eh? No need to chuck up the sponge yet. Well, there's life, there's hope, you know, Doctor. Not a particularly tactful observation, perhaps, but Chief Inspector Russell, a kind-hearted man, meant it well. Chapter 12 
Germ drama. Charge of attempted murder against doctor. Wife's body exhumed. From our own correspondent, Merchester, Devonshire, Friday. That he attempted to murder William Andrew Chatford of the firm of Shipton, Ogden, Ermhead and Chatford, solicitors of Merchester, and Madeleine Winifred Bourne of Wyvern's Cross by administering poisonous germs to them, to wit, Bacillus and Pteridides. These were the words uttered in the old-fashioned Merchester Police Court this morning, and were the prelude of what promises to be a great drama of the law. The man in the dock was Dr. Edmund Alfred Bickley, whose appearance there was the culmination of a series of sensational events during the present week. Dr. Bickley, who wore a blue serge suit and a dark tie, is a slightly built man with a ruddy complexion. He faced the magistrates with coolness, but kept his countenance averted from the public during the short time he was in the dock. He followed with keen and critical interest the evidence of Superintendent Allhays, Deputy Chief Constable of Devonshire, who arrested him. Yesterday evening, I went to Dr. Bickley's house in Wyvern's Cross, accompanied by Chief Inspector Russell of Scotland Yard, said the Deputy Chief Constable. I saw him and told him I was about to arrest him on a serious charge. You have no evidence. I cautioned him and then said, I now arrest you on a charge of attempting to murder William Andrew Chatford and Madeline Winifred Bourne by administering to them poisonous germs, to wit, Bacillus and Pteridides, on the 14th of September last. Dr. Bickley replied, You can't do that. You have no evidence. No evidence at all. I am instructed by the Director of Public Prosecutions, who has taken the case up, to ask for a remand of a week. I shall offer no further evidence today. Mr. F. L. Gunhill, who represented Bickley, said that he did not intend to apply for bail at this stage. Women cheer prisoner. A large crowd that included many women was waiting near the police court in the hope of seeing Dr. Bickley. When he appeared, cheers were raised, and many people struggled forward in an attempt to shake his hand. The prisoner smilingly acknowledged the ovation as the police hurried him into the taxi which was waiting, and the cab drove off amid a remarkable demonstration of sympathy with the accused man. Long Investigations the arrest of Dr. Bickley is the sequel to investigations which have been in progress in the neighbourhood of Wyvern's Cross for a considerable time. I learn that these investigations were prompted by the Home Office as a result of communications which were made to London as long ago as last June. Scotland Yard detectives have been pursuing inquiries in the district for several weeks. Mrs. Bickley died in distressing circumstances on the 9th of April last year. She had been suffering from a painful illness. An inquest was held, and a verdict returned of accidental death through an overdose of morphia self-administered. The little community of Wyvern's Cross is in a ferment of excitement. The Scotland Yard officers, working from Merchester, had gone about their inquiries so quietly and unassumingly that nobody except Mr. Chatford and Mr. and Mrs. Bourne had been aware of their presence at all. Indeed. So well had the secret been kept that the news of the arrest came as a veritable bombshell to the villagers, only to be followed by the still greater bombshell later in the day of the exhumation of Mrs. Bickley's body. I am informed that when Dr. Bickley issued his invitations to tea on the 14th, during which it is alleged that the poison germs were administered, the officers were hastily consulted and advised an acceptance in order that suspicions should not be aroused by an unneighbourly refusal. The sequel came as unexpectedly to the detectives as to the alleged victims. I understand that sensational developments are expected. The Exhumation The exhumation of Mrs. Bickley's body, ordered by the Home Office, took place late this afternoon and is causing a tremendous local sensation. Digging operations began just after five o'clock, 
but the coffin was not brought to the surface until after dark. The little churchyard at Wyvern's Cross was closed during the operation to all but officials engaged in the case and the grave diggers. The scene was eerie in the extreme. The grave which sheltered Mrs. Bickley's body lies under an ancient yew. When the coffin had been scraped free of earth, it was laid under this venerable tree to await the arrival of Dr. Sowerby, the Home Office pathologist. A few minutes after nine o'clock, the headlights of a motor car ascending a winding hill could be seen, and five minutes later, Dr. Sowerby alighted, accompanied by Detective Chief Inspector Russell of Scotland Yard. Policemen carrying hurricane lanterns led them to the graveside. A dark night, the gloomy sky oppressively overcast, the rising wind moaning through the branches of the ancient yew, the little party standing round the open grave, their shadows distorted into grotesque shapes by the flickering light of the lanterns, the silent knot of awe-stricken villagers looking on from a distance. Such was the impressive solemnity of the spectacle as the handsome oak casket with brass fittings and nameplate was hoisted onto a hand bier and the little procession moved off, led by a constable with a lantern, to a tiny disused cottage with whitewashed walls and thatched roof which stands nearby. Only an oil lamp, supplemented by the hurricane lantern, served to illuminate the post-mortem examination conducted by Dr. Salby. The expert, however, with the celerity and skill born of long years of practice, speedily performed it and removed certain organs from the body. Exhumation Law The law relating to exhumations is that a coroner can order the exhumation of a body if he has not already held an inquest. But if he has previously held an inquest, he must apply to the Home Secretary for an order. Arrest, a sensation. That the arrest of Dr. Bickley has caused a sensation locally is to put it at its mildest. One of the most respected, as well as one of the most popular figures in the district, he came to Wyvern's Cross just over 14 years ago, and since then, by his professional skill and kindness, has endeared himself. A graduate of his war record? Mr. F. L. Gunhill rubbed his podgy hands together and beamed hearteningly on his client. He looked far too cheerful a little fat man to be a solicitor. Oh, you needn't worry about that, Bickley. They won't press that charge. They know they couldn't get a conviction. You'll see. The grand jury will throw out the bill as sure as eggs. Why, they've no real evidence at all. I should think not indeed, Dr. Bickley agreed indignantly. Hmm, yes. Pity remarked on it, though. Still, no matter, no matter. They have a prima facie case, no doubt, and we'll have to get out our answer to it just in case. But, of course, they only made the arrest to free their hands for this other investigation. Now, that's what we've got to concentrate on. It's outrageous, Dr. Bickley said thinly. I could never have conceived such a thing. To lose such a wife is bad enough, Gunhill, but... To be put on one's trial for murdering her? Yes, of course, of course, shocking. We'll go into the matter of counsel more fully, of course, but I strongly advise briefing Sir Francis Lee Bannerton. Strongly. Just the man for us. If he'll take the case, of course. Why ever shouldn't he? Oh, he's a busy man, Lee Bannerton, you know, said Mr. Gunhill, with something of an evasive air. Still, we'll go into that later. There are just one or two points I want to examine with you now. Dr. Bickley looked up suddenly. Look here, Gunhill. They haven't got a case, have they? I mean, there's even less evidence than in the other. How could there be any evidence against me of such a ridiculous charge? I mean, it's so absurd. Oh, they've got hold of one or two small things... 
Nothing of major importance, I quite agree. In fact, we're quite justified in feeling every confidence. Every confidence. I don't mind telling you, Bickley, that I consider an adverse verdict almost unthinkable. So I should hope, indeed. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't take every precaution, said Mr. Gunhill, with robust sense. We should, and we must. Of course, if the judge rules out the evidence on the attempted murder charge as inadmissible in the major one, the result is a foregone conclusion. But the prosecution will fight for its admission without a doubt. Still, even there, the odds are in our favour. It will depend entirely on the judge. They can't possibly find me guilty. It would be too preposterous. Dr. Bickley was quite calm. It was impossible that he could be found guilty. Exactly. Precisely. I'm delighted to see you so confident. <laughs> In fact, I'm every bit as much so myself. Mr. Gunhill rubbed his hands and looked extremely confident. Still, as I said, we must take every precaution. Now... Assuming that this evidence is admitted, I have an inkling, yes, indeed, more than an inkling, that the prosecution will make a big point of your conduct in the sick room. We haven't gone properly into that yet, have we? No, no, of course not. So, I should like you to tell me just how it came about that you diagnosed botulism in Chatford's case when he actually had nothing of the sort. How was that, eh? Two little tiny points of red appeared on Dr. Bickley's cheekbones, as they had since his arrest whenever he thought of Lidston. I could hardly be expected to know that I was being deceived by a fellow practitioner, could I? With the police and a bacteriologist waiting in the next room to try and trap me. Of course not. It was most high-handed. Then you were deceived by Lidston about the symptoms. Oh, most certainly I was. From my own case, I had strong suspicions of botulism. As it turned out, I was mistaken, but that's neither here nor there, which I wanted to confirm from Chatford's. I questioned Lidston, and what he told me did confirm it. I see. Yes. Of course, you understand the point they'll try to make. Quite, said Dr. Bickley disgustedly. You explained that. And equally, that they'll credit me with maliciously substituting the capsule with the culture for the one containing jalap and cream of tartar, which they found, exactly as I said in my surgery. No doubt. I'm supposed to have been trying to commit a murder. We mustn't forget that. Yes, yes, soothed Mr. Gunhill. So, Lidston deliberately deceived you. Well, that's quite a good line. Quite sound, in view of the trap they laid for you. Yes, I think we can take that line. It happens to be the truth, Dr. Bickley said coldly. Oh, yes. Oh, naturally. And the capsule. Quite sound, quite sound. Yes, I'm sure we can meet that attack adequately. Perfectly. I'm not worried on that head at all. Well, as I've told you all the time, Gunhill... I don't see how the case can be sent for trial at all. I've been watching the magistrates pretty closely, and I'm quite sure they don't mean to commit me. Possibly, possibly. We haven't had all the evidence yet, but it's quite possible. It will be extremely unfair of them if they do, observed Dr. Bickley warmly. No doubt. Quite so. I'm not sure I don't agree. Because, really, there's only one point in the whole case which gives me the slightest uneasiness. Oh, the very slightest. And no doubt you can explain that. I'm quite sure I can, Dr. Bickley smiled. Of course he could. Quite so, exactly. It's part of the evidence Mrs. Bourne is to give. It hasn't been divulged yet, but I have been given officially to understand that she is prepared to swear that when you called at the hall on the day of Mrs. Bickley's death, you informed her that your wife was dead. 
although you could not possibly have known so soon yourself unless, uh, well, <laughs> you see the interpretation that might be made. Dr. Bickley was sitting very stiffly, fighting to prevent the effect of this blow from showing in his face. Good God! Yes, of course. He remembered clearly now, remembered every detail, and how Madeleine had shrunk away from him as if she almost suspected the truth. Perhaps she had. The hag! She was capable of any beastly, horrible suspicion like that. But this was simply dreadful. How could he have forgotten it so completely? This incredible blunder. And how was he now to explain it? That is quite untrue. His mind forced utterance of the words before he could think at all, in blank, instinctive denial. Untrue, eh? Mr. Gunhill did not seem quite so exuberantly confident. That's good, that's fine. Untrue. You're quite certain, Bickley? She's prepared to swear to it. In fact, it was her confiding this to Chatford that uh, really began the whole thing. Quite certain. It's an abominable lie. I see. I see. Then it'll be just your word against hers. She's an abominable, malicious woman, said Dr. Bickley with stiff face. I remember my poor wife telling me what a liar she was. I can give you plenty of evidence on that point. I shall expect you to bring that forward very strongly. Blackening the character of an opposing witness, eh? Mr. Gunhill remarked dubiously. Risky. Very risky. We shall have to consider that most carefully. I should like the truth about that woman to be established, whatever the risk. Yes. Yes, well, we must see. We must take advice. We must consult Lee Bannerton about that. Be guided by him. Well, well. Just your word against hers. I see. How is her husband today, by the way? Dr. Bickley asked, and hardly troubled to hide his malice behind the question. For retribution at last had followed Madeleine's repeated and mean refusals to improve the sanitation at the hall. Denny was down with typhoid. He had been taken ill just a fortnight after Dr. Bickley's arrest. Dangerously ill, Dr. Bickley had not been in the least sorry to learn. Conceited young ass. He had played his part in that hypocritical tea party too. God, how Dr. Bickley hated that trio. And now there was danger of losing him. It seemed that Madeleine had never loved him so well. Typical. Still, there were consolations for her. Widowhood would give her the most marvellous opportunities. About the same, I'm sorry to say. About the same, said Mr. Gunhill rather flurriedly, as if he had been not a little discomposed by the peculiar quality of the small smile on his client's face. Anyhow, no better. Really, I'm sorry to hear that. Most sorry, purred his client. For the first time since his arrest, Dr. Bickley slept badly that night. His confidence in the issue remained unchecked. The point was a nasty one, no doubt, but not damning. Besides, it was inconceivable that the jury should not take his word in preference to that slut. But his loathing for Madeleine was so intense that his mind could not rest. Why? Why had he not killed her when it was in his power to do so? And damn the consequences. Madeleine was almost worth hanging for. And the creature had accepted his offers of friendship, broken bread with him in his own house, all the time with her tongue in her cheek, ready, even then, to swear his life away with her lies. The filthy, hypocritical, murderous vixen. Well, let her give her slanderous tongue full play. 
He would see to it at least that she left the court without a shred of decency left her. Show her up for the despicable thing she was. Chapter 13 The trial of Dr. Edmund Alfred Bickley for the murder of his wife opened on Monday the 18th of January. It was remarked by the reporters in court that the prisoner walked into the dock with quite a jaunty air and looked round the court with a slight smile. In their columns the next day, they hinted deprecation of such levity on an occasion so critical. The prisoner did not share their view. He did not find the occasion in the least critical. He found it only a tiresome prelude to liberty. During the last three months, he had, of course, had his bad moments, but they had not been many. His confidence had never been really shaken. Dr. Bickley never had any doubt that he was not of the sort that gets convicted. It was, he could not help feeling, rather impertinence to put him on trial at all. Why, the grand jury could not have thrown out the bills. And for it all he had to thank Chatford and Madeleine. No, the next time they should not get off so easily. Edmund Alfred Bickley, you are charged in this indictment that on the ninth day of April 1928, at Wyvern's Cross, in the county of Devonshire, you, feloniously, willfully, and of your malice aforethought, did kill and murder one Julia Elizabeth Mary Bickley. How say you? Are you guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. Not guilty, of course, you old idiot. Do you think I'd tell a lie? During the tedious swearing of the jury, no women, thank goodness, Dr. Bickley began to speculate on what was to happen next to Chatford and Madeleine, something with plenty of pain attached to it. He found himself curiously sustained by such a contemplation. Gentlemen of the jury, the prisoner at the bar, Edmund Alfred Bickley, is charged in this indictment that on the ninth day of April 1928 at Wyvern's Cross in the county of Devonshire, he, feloniously, willfully, and of his malice aforethought, did kill and murder one Julia Elizabeth Mary Bickley. Upon this indictment he has been arraigned, and upon arraignment he has pleaded not guilty, and has put himself upon God and his country, which country you are. Your duty, therefore, is to inquire whether he be guilty or not guilty, and to hearken to the evidence. What rot it all was. However, the jury looked suitably impressed. Dr. Bickley surveyed them benevolently. Twelve good men and true. At a guess, ten farmers and two professional men. Two farmers for certain, for Dr. Bickley recognised them. One came from not far outside the Wyvern's Cross District. Dr. Bickley had quite a nodding acquaintance with him. He sent a look of recognition across the court now, and the man responded with an embarrassed little nod. Dr. Bickley felt more satisfied than ever. Here was one man ready for an acquittal already. What a farce it all was. He exchanged a smile with Gunhill, and a self-possessed little nod with Sir Francis Lee Bannerton. Let the fools of spectators stare. They need not think they could put him out of countenance. A sudden hush succeeded the bustle in the court. Somebody was getting to his feet. Of course, that would be the Attorney General. How ridiculous! To send the Attorney General himself down on such a forlorn hope. They must realise how hard up they were for a case. Oratory instead of evidence it was to be. Sir Bernard Deverell was a tall, thin man with a beaky nose. He began to speak in quite conversational, though impersonal, tones, addressing a point 
somewhere on the wall about four feet above the heads of the jury. Well, now we're off, thought Dr Bickley. He listened at first with close interest. Of course, there was nothing new to come out. He knew exactly the strength and the weakness of the case against him. But it was quite absorbing to hear the facts set out in orderly array. On his knee was a pad of scribbling paper for notes, and his pencil hovered over it alertly. May it please your lordship, gentlemen of the jury, it is my duty, in conjunction with my learned friends, to lay before you the evidence in support of the indictment which you have just heard. The unfortunate lady, into whose death we are inquiring, Dr. Bickley's pencil drooped. The quiet voice went on. Morphia symptoms, inquest, exhumation, post-mortem examination. There was nothing to make notes about here. Dr. Bickley noticed that Sir Bernard had a habit of bunching his gown up on his left hip as he spoke, rolling it gradually up his thigh till he had got all the slack into a tight ball and then letting it drop and beginning all over again. Silly. His attention began to wander. It was caught again abruptly. The Attorney General had dealt with the history of the case up to the time of Mrs. Bickley's death. He began to touch on the reasons her husband might have had for rejoicing instead of sorrowing over that death. Motive, motive, motive. Dr. Bickley had not heard the full account of the motive imputed to him. It filled him with sudden horror. They had got the truth, the real, secret truth. That devil Madeleine had... A cold sweat broke out over him as he listened to the measured voice recounting the story of that disastrous passion. This was terrible. Obviously, quite obviously, the motive was overwhelming. He dared not look at the jury. Madeleine was determined to hang him with her lies. Hang him! He tried to shut his ears to the damning recital, drew little pictures on his pad, grotesque faces, anything to distract his attention. Whatever happened, he must preserve his composure. Let his face for one moment show the terror in his mind, and it was all over. He felt a thousand eyes boring into his forehead trying to burn their way through to his thought. God, this was awful. Awful! In the luncheon interval, one enterprising journalist managed to get a look at that page of the pad. He made quite a feature of it in his report the next day. The prisoner, who preserved a jaunty attitude throughout the day's proceedings, showed his indifference to the Attorney General's opening of the case by... When the court adjourned for lunch, Dr. Bickley was weak with the strain. Some legal argument had preceded the judge's rising, but he had been unable to attend to it. Something about the admissibility of the Chatford evidence. The jury had been sent out of court. It was important, of course, most important, Gunhill had considered, but its importance had vanished now. He was as good as convicted already. On that opening speech alone, convicted before the trial had scarcely begun. It was terrible. Gunhill came to see him in the interval, rubbing his hands as usual. Well, we can congratulate ourselves so far, I think. Yes, certainly. Dr. Pickley looked at him with haggard eyes. Congratulate ourselves? Yes, a very fair opening. Scrupulously fair. Sir Bernard let you down quite lightly, don't you think? Dr. Bickley did not answer. It's a pity that Mrs. Bourne's a widow, though, Mr. Gunhill added, shaking his head. A recently bereaved widow always has an effect on the jury, invariably. Well, well, let's hope she doesn't cry. 
But really, Bickley, I must say we are. Uh, yes. Every confidence. After lunch, the legal argument was resumed. The jury was still absent. Dr. Bickley, quite recovered now. How absurd to be so upset by such a small matter. Nerves, of course. Listened at first with interest, but soon became bored. Rex versus Gearing, 1849. 18LJ, MC215. Rex versus Flanagan, 15. Cox, 403. They flourished books about, at the judge, at each other, at anyone who looked a likely person to have a book flourished at him. Sir Francis Lee Bannerton made great play with Rex versus Winslow, 8 Cox, 397, but nobody seemed very much impressed except Sir Francis himself. In the end, the judge decided that the evidence was admissible. Dr. Bickley was disappointed, but not disheartened. Gunhill and Sir Francis had both warned him that such a decision was extremely probable. Well, it only meant that the farce would be a more protracted one. Thank goodness that opening speech was finished, though. There had been some nasty moments there. But it wasn't. The jury came back, and the Attorney General rose again. Quite chattily, he told them of Dr. Bickley's attempts to kill Madeleine and Chatford. The curious thing, thought Dr. Bickley, listening with disquiet growing once more, was how right he was. And he spoke as if he knew he was right, too. The most remarkable little details. If the jury realised that he was right, it began to seem almost impossible that they should not. The fact that he was grew more and more glaringly apparent. Dr. Bickley again found himself unable to glance at their faces as Sir Bernard made his damning points one after the other. He did not give way to panic again. Would not give way, but it was really terrible. To have to sit there and listen silently, helplessly, while this man invited the jury to hang him. When at last... The Attorney General sat down. Dr. Bickley realised that his underclothes were wringing wet. Had he still got a chance? He caught Gunhill's eye and was astonished to notice that it was still as gleaming and jovial as ever. Apparently he had then. Glancing surreptitiously at the jury, he noticed one of them stifling a yawn. Good heavens! The calling of the first witnesses was sheer anticlimax. The Attorney General, as if satisfied with a good day's work, had actually left the court. Dr. Bickley watched him go with such relief that he could have laughed out loud, perhaps a little hysterically, at his retreating back. The only two witnesses called that day were examined by Sir Bernard's junior. And what did their evidence amount to? Nothing. Simply nothing. A surveyor produced plans of Fairlawn. What on earth did they want plans of Fairlawn for? And Florence, the maid, recounted her impressions of Mrs. Bickley's illness in the events of the fatal day. The idea left with Florence was that Mrs. Bickley had been very puzzled about her headaches and could not account for them in any way. Well, so had Sir Tamerton Folliot been... And Dr. Bickley himself, there was nothing new there. And as for the rest, Florence's evidence was positively favourable. Obviously, she did not believe the doctor guilty, and as one on the spot, her opinions must carry weight. And in cross-examination, Florence quite agreed that she did not see how it was possible for Dr. Bickley to have come back that afternoon without being observed by either her or the cook. Well, you might say impossible. In his re-examination, Sir Bernard's junior had to treat her almost as a hostile witness. When the court adjourned, 
Dr. Bickley had quite recovered his spirit. One must preserve one sense of proportion. That was the secret. The proceedings dragged on. With the tedious taking of evidence, examination and cross-examination, ridiculously polite exchanges between counsel, all the flummery of a full-dress trial. Dr. Bickley alternated now between complete confidence and uneasiness. But confidence certainly prevailed. There were nasty moments. Several of them. Far too many of them. But Gunhill was always very reassuring afterwards. And though sometimes quite appalled at the time, Dr. Bickley was always able to call proportion to his aid before too long. Madeleine's evidence, for instance, to Dr. Bickley's cynical perception, Madeleine was reveling in the situation, in the notoriety, the limelight, the sympathy, even in her widowhood. But knowing how he himself had been taken in, he realised that it was too much to hope that the scales could be stripped from the other male eyes in court. He settled himself down not to listen, and began to draw a very elaborate and meticulous study of a galloping horse. The reporter, who was featuring Dr. Bickley's artistic efforts for the benefit of his readers, hastily jotted down, ashamed to face old love testifying against him, prisoner pretended to be absorbed in his sketching. In low, candid tones, Madeleine revealed the hideous pursuit to which she had been subjected. By innuendo, rather than by any direct statement, Dr. Bickley was shown as a ravening beast, endeavouring to get his claws into pure and innocent maidenhood. The reporters sharpened their pencils. Here was the goods. There would be strong coffee and wet towels that night for the headline merchants. Madeleine, a figure of infinite pathos in her widow's weeds, noticed the sharpening of pencils and promptly wept a little. The judge, the attorney general, the jury, even Sir Francis Lee Bannerton, looked their consternation. Dr. Bickley, quite unable to stop himself listening, abandoned his horse and writhed in the dock with impotent rage. Now, Mrs. Bourne, you've told us that the prisoner forced his way into your bedroom and there proposed marriage to you. You naturally referred, as you say, to the fact that he was already married. Kindly tell us what he replied to that. Madeleine hesitated, in gentle feminine reluctance. Then, with quiet courage, she did her duty. He said, Julia is dead. As every newspaper on the following day remarked, sensation. Dr. Bickley glared at Madeline. On this point he knew what chance there was of losing the case depended. In spite of the sinking feeling in his stomach, he strove to give an impression of a man righteously indignant at being faced with a foul lie. The Attorney General sat down. As the cross-examination proceeded, Dr. Bickley's heart sank lower and lower. In spite of his warnings, it was clear that even Sir Francis Lee Bannerton had been taken in by Madeleine. He handled her gently, openly sympathised with her, played up to her own play-acting. Dr. Bickley, almost frantic, began writing passionate little notes addressed to his counsel. Sir Francis would not even look at... Dr. Bickley could have shouted at him with fury. The worst of it was that Sir Francis had all along refused point-blank to attack Madeleine. He had considered it thoroughly bad policy in view of her recent widowhood and the effect she would undoubtedly make on the court. He had said, with the utmost casualness, that he intended to leave his line of cross-examination till the time came. He would consider Madeleine when she gave her evidence and decide then and there what line to take with her. And now 
He was taking no line at all, simply giving the case away. Good God! Leading her on to more and more outrageous statements and innuendos against himself. That was what he was doing. Dr. Bickley grew more and more frantic. It was a glimpse at the Attorney General's face that made him think. Sir Bernard was leaning back with his eyes on the ceiling, and an expression of such utter blankness that it must have been concealing some inward sorrow. Dr. Bickley gazed at him for a moment in astonishment. For Sir Bernard... looking extremely happy at having his case won for him like this, yet, undoubtedly, Sir Bernard was not. Dr. Bickley turned his attention back to his own counsel and began to listen with reason instead of emotion. The next moment he understood, and in the reaction of the moment uttered a sharp little laugh. The judge frowned on him, but Dr. Bickley did not care. For once, Madeleine had overreached herself.